who are celebrity obsessed? Seriously, how many of you devote a lot of your life to following the lives of celebrities? You're almost like uh, stalkers, actually, right? How many of you are stalkers? I stalk the stalkers. So, so who do you follow? Who do you follow and why are you obsessed with that? Why? Who else are you obsessed with? Tell me about your obsessions. Bono. So, because uh, sometimes we, we follow our the lives of celebrities more than we follow our own life, right? What what is it that you like about their lives that's so interesting? Why is it glamorous? Okay, so they have lots of money. Why else do you care? Okay. <laughs> what's what what's the fantasy? What do we follow? The power to influence people. So what is the fantasy that you want to trade places with them? What do you think their lives are like? Really good. Are they like ours? Yes. I wouldn't say that. Actually, some are human. I think there's more headache because they have like the uh, paparazzi chasing them or they have the chasing them. Okay, one thing that's horrible about their lives actually is they can't go anywhere without being recognized, which is pretty irritating when you're trying to like sit down and have dinner with your family and people are coming up and asking you for autographs. There's a downside to this. But the thing that people often miss and a lot of what we talk about today's talk is about is we focus so much on the lives of the celebrities, but we forget about the people who are, are the ones that are actually covering their lives in the first place. Because the people who bring their lives to you are like you. They're not like celebrities. That's something that gets missed. How many of you would love to cover celebrities for a living? Why do you want to do that? Why? Why? Why is it exciting to cover celebrities? Because you see them everywhere. You want to be kind of like role models. But what kind of interactions do you think you would have with them? Because I spent four years covering celebrities in Los Angeles. And by the way, my name is Keith Bars. For those of you who don't know me, I'm <coughs> communication professor here. <coughs> Every one of these folks are people that I interviewed, many of which you'll recognize. <coughs> some of which you wrote, it was 1991 through 1995. So some of these folks aren't as famous now as they were then. But you know who this is? Yeah. Yes. It is Madonna. Oh my God. How about this guy? <laughs> Anyone? Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. Yeah. Um, Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. <clears throat> I will tell you this. I found the people who covered celebrities a lot more interesting than the celebrities themselves. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to give you an insider's view today of what it's like <laughs> to cover the entertainment industry, the positives and the negatives, and the reality of it. Which the first thing you gotta get out of your head, okay, is the people who cover celebrities for a living, we're not hanging out at their meal on the weekends with them in Malibu, sucking down champagne. We go back to our futon, <clears throat> where we live, struggling to get by. So there's a real disconnect between the people who cover the celebrities and the celebrities themselves. Also, you have to remember, I wasn't often having personal one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. Right? I was there to get the sound bite about their latest movie or their latest television project or whatever. And I'm sure that in most cases, within 30 seconds of doing an interview with me or really with any television crew in Hollywood, they didn't remember us. But we were part of the machine that made them famous. In fact, you can almost make an argument that those of us peons who slept on futons, without us, there is no celebrity. 
right? Because what is a celebrity? Anyway, what's a celebrity? Come on, what's a celebrity? What is that? Someone who's in the media all the time. Okay, because part of it's about mediated images, right? How do you even know if they're famous? Everyone knows them. How do they know them? TV. TV. Or? TV. News. Some kind of mediated image, right? Or mediated sound or whatever. That's how we know who they are. That's the only reason they're famous. You pull the media out of that, they're not famous anymore. Even if somebody who's a movie star, right? <clears throat> how do they make their money? Movies. Making movies. That's how we know that. And what's really different between them and us is the money and the fame. And something else that gets lost is most people who are, are famous, people who are movie stars, and have similar kinds of jobs, most of them worked really hard to get there. And they had to have hard work. They had to get a little lucky. And honestly, they had to be a little delusional, too. Like, for example, the case of Harrison Ford, who was working as a carpenter on the set of when George Lucas was cast in this little movie you might have heard of called Star Wars. Back in the mid-70s, crazy stuff with robots in the desert. So he was bringing in various actors to do readings to find the four main characters, the Han Solo and Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker and so on. Anyway, in one of the groupings, the Han Solo person didn't show up. So Harrison Ford was there on set. He was a carpenter on set. And Lucas said, hey, do me a favor, can you sit in? We just we need another body. And Harrison Ford's ended up, that's a good job. But he was not an overnight success. Most of these folks toiled for years and years and years before they got that break. And they were crazy about it. They waited tables. They kept at it when any rational person would have given up by then. But they kept that, that belief. So there's a lot of hard work that goes along with this, too. Those of you who have from mass media class, you already know this. But for those of you who haven't, or maybe you're from outside Atlantic Cape, agenda study theory. The reason why we're obsessed with celebrities is based on this idea. And um, we often get it wrong because people always like to say things like, the media tells me what to think, man. <laughs> if the media tells you what to think, you must be pretty weak will. <clears throat> but it sure tells you what to think about. And that's what Sean McCombs said back in 1977. It's still true. The media sets our agenda. It puts the topics on our agenda every day for what we're going to think about, what we're going to do. And it won't tell us, think this way about Obama, or think this way about Romney. But it will tell us to be thinking about the election, to be thinking about the horse race between the two of them. So that's one of the things that the media does really, really well, is it puts it on the agenda. What you do with it is really up to you. By the way, you do have power in all this. <clears throat> I would not have had a job working at E! Entertainment Television covering celebrities if you didn't care about them. Because we had to find an audience for this stuff. And you guys were the audience. Um, and I have to tell you also that like, <clears throat> when I worked at E! in LA, we had an assignment editor named Barry Nugent. And we worked like a nine hour shift. And so Barry would always have nighttime shoots for movie premieres and so on that he needed to cover. So he'd call me over and he'd be like, hey, Keith, movie premiere tonight, so and so's going to be there. And I said, Barry, dude, you know I could care less. You know I don't care who's there. You know that celebrities don't really do anything for me. But if you want me to help you out, if you need an event covered, I'm there. I'm a team player. I'll be happy to cover the event. But to be honest, Barry, I don't care if Jesus himself is there. That doesn't interest me. It's the job. A premiere is a premiere, regardless of who is at the site. And one of the things you, you'll realize, too, it may all sound very glamorous, but it's really a lot of hard work. And going to a movie premiere sounds great, except that and I'm going to jump right in here and then go back. Oh, yeah. It's like pre-doing the whole presentation. I'm not standing here. I'm standing here. 
I'm standing right there. I'm on the other side of the rope line. I'm not walking down like <laughs> I'm going like this. I'm jostling a bunch of other media to get my sound bite. It's a little different than what you might imagine. And a lot of times the celebrities don't really want to talk to you. Where they'll have very canned responses that they've memorized, like the dreaded junket. This is one of those industry things where they'll rent out a hotel or motel room, usually it's a hotel room. These are celebrities, after all. They'll rent out a hotel room for like 12 hours. And then they'll tell you, hey, E Entertainment Television, you got five minutes with Becky. And she's going to talk about her movie, and you can't ask her about anything else. Everything else is off limits. You can only talk to her about the latest. Then you get five minutes, and then they roll in the next crew from CBS, and the next crew from Access Hollywood, and the next crew from Entertainment Tonight. Chugging in, chugging out, chugging in, chugging out. Becky's in there promoting her movie, promoting her movie, promoting her movie. So what I always did in that situation is I would ask them something out of left field. I always got in trouble, but I didn't really care. The publicist was always mad. <clears throat> But I'd do some research about their background and I'd say something like, Hey Becky, that third grade teacher that you had, seemed like he was a real influence on you in terms of wanting to become a movie star. And the person would be like, well, oh, you actually did your homework. So you always try to throw them off, because celebrities get these can memorize responses. And I gotta tell you too, and I know you don't want to hear this, but when I think back to my life covering Hollywood, there are very, very few celebrities that stand out in my mind. They were really not interesting people, for the most part. I wasn't on the inside of their lives. <clears throat> I wasn't hanging out at their house with them. I'm just seeing them, you know, premiere or a party or whatever. But there are a lot more interesting ways to spend the time. <clears throat> Which, by the way, feel free to cut in at any time, ask questions any time. And even if you have some weird question that you always want to ask about covering the entertainment business, feel free to shout them out any time. <clears throat> I have a question. Yeah. Uh, have you ever interviewed anyone, you know, more behind the camera? You know, not a celebrity, but like a director, <clears throat> or a producer, or writer, or something? It's funny that you mention that. Thank you for setting that up like we had arranged it in the day. <laughs> my, uh, my favorite interview of all time was with a director named Frank Darabont, who had been mostly known for being a screenwriter up until then. And back in, I can't remember what year it was, sometime between 91 and 95, because that's when I worked there, he directed a film. Shawshank Redemption. 94. <clears throat> 94. And uh, thank you for that. And the thing that impressed me about Frank Darabont, well, first of all, this is his stage, his directorial debut, so he had been a screenwriter up until that. And when you're a screenwriter, you're feeling pretty humble about yourself, because you get slapped around a lot if you're the screenwriter. So he came in to E on Columbus Day, and I guess it must have been 1994, Columbus Day, 1994. No entourage, not in a town car or a limo. Just drove himself, parked in the parking lot, walked up the stairs himself, there were no publicists in tow, and we sat down and did an interview. And he was the rare celebrity that was actually as interested in my life as I was in finding out about his life. Actually, he was super interested in his life. But I was interested in doing the story. And um, those are the people that you remember. And Frank Darabont still has a reputation in the industry for being a pretty down-to-earth, pretty grounded guy. He, he later went on to direct other films like The Green Mile. He's had a pretty accomplished career. But this was at the very beginning of it. And I'm actually going to, this leads nicely into it. Um, I'm going to show you the piece that I did for E! News Daily based upon my interview with, with Frank Darabont. I think you get a sense of even in that short time frame, because of course one of the things about television news is that a very long story is about two minutes. That's really long. So that's about what I had. And you'll interview somebody for, in some cases, hours, and then you cut it down to you know, a matter of a couple of minutes. So I'm going to um, 
to show you that piece to maybe get a sense of, of who he was, but that was one of my most memorable experiences. And I often found it much more interesting to interview directors, producers, people like that, because they had a much wider view of the world. And um, many times the actors, first of all, when I worked in television news, we deridingly called the anchors and reporters talent, <clears throat> which is supposed to be a slap, because they were me. They were me. Many of them were me. They could read off the teleprompter, but there were times where I felt like a Ben Shrillaquist, because I would write, I'd go out and report the story. I'd get all the sound bites. I'd log all the footage. I would write the script, give it to them, they'd read it, right? Then I'd take those tracks, put them over the piece, and then when E! News Daily area that night it looked like they had actually voiced that piece, they were just me. All they did was loan their voice to it in a stand-up, and, and our anchor at the time, um, our female anchor, we probably had to do the stand-up 19 times because she wasn't the sharpest tool in the show. <laughs> And so, I'll show you her hair. <laughs> Did you ask? She was a piece of work. So, <clears throat> is she in this one? Huh. Who well, isn't that interesting? Yeah. I've neglected to include her. <laughs> That must have been some kind of uh, Freudian <laughs> slip. But it was a, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, um, how come you stopped working over there? I don't like Los Angeles. I spent four years out of there, and I learned a lot, mm -hmm. and I enjoyed what I learned. But how many of you ever been to Los Angeles? Okay, a handful. How many of you went by choice? <laughs> um, What'd you think? Now, actually, what's the longest anyone's been there? Anybody spend a week? Yeah, I was there for a week. For a week. Anybody spend any more time than a week? A couple weeks. All right. What'd you get out of it? Peter, tell us. What was like? It was like New York with better weather, kind of, but I wouldn't want to live there. It kind of took the sheen off everything, you know? Okay. Um, I love the architecture, but everything that is on TV is much smaller. Like, um, the Chinese theater, like, you think it's going to be like this grand place, but it's just like this little building. Oh, yeah, and Hollywood and Vine, man. Yeah. <laughs> They've cleaned it up in recent times. But when you go to Hollywood, which, by the way, Hollywood has two meanings. Hollywood is a neighborhood in Los Angeles, <laughs> and it's also a euphemism for describing the film and television industry, right? <clears throat> the neighborhood that was Hollywood, Hollywood and Vine, sort of the epicenter of the Hollywood neighborhood and where Berman's Chinese Theater is and Ripley's Believe or Not and, and all that, you had a better chance of finding a hooker there um, <laughs> in the 90s than you did a celebrity. It was a pretty rundown area. It was kind of skid rowish. They've, they've really cleaned it up since then, but um, it was it was not at all what you would expect. But, it, but LA is, it's a very fickle place. It's a very surface place. People don't have a lot of depth there. And nobody's from there. 90% of, just to compare and contrast, <clears throat> in the Philadelphia metropolitan area, which we all live in, right? 90% of the people who live in the Philadelphia metropolitan area have always lived in the Philadelphia metropolitan area. 90% of the people who live in Los Angeles were not born in Los Angeles. So it's exactly the opposite. And that creates a very transient kind of world. In some ways, it's exciting because you have this meld of cultures and personalities from all over the country and all over the world. But it also means there's no there there. There's no real definitive identity or core. Yeah, and I, I know you guys all think that having Endless summer would be the most awesome thing in the world. But I gotta tell you, after 12 months of nothing but sunshine, I had about had enough. Um, 
you couldn't mark the seasons. Palm trees don't change in any way. I was used to being able to look at trees and know what time of year it was. Couldn't tell. I had one, one of my coworkers was an LA native, and that's a really rare thing. Um, he was like, well, you know, in the winter, it's very different from the summer. I'm like, how? He said, well, it only gets up to about 64 in the winter. I'm like, yes, you're right. It's high of 75 the rest of the year, and high of 65 in the winter. That is much different. <laughs> I might have to put a jacket on once in a while or something. Um, it would rain only in December and January, and when it rained, it was like snow here. <clears throat> People were panicked. They couldn't go anywhere. There were accidents everywhere. And all joking aside, because of the way that the topography with the hills and so on, there were landslides. And so it was, it was a mess. No, they didn't do that. They were a little smarter than us when it came to that. So they, oh my god, there's an inch of snow on the ground. We might not get deliveries for months. We're like three hours. Um, but it was, I found it to be, it was a place that there wasn't a lot of middle ground. You either liked it or you did it. And I'm glad I did it, but it wasn't for me. And I, uh, when I went out for the reunion, the entertainment television reunion this summer, I was reminded of the traffic. So I brought my, I hadn't been out there in like 13 years. And so I brought my, my Garmin with me. You know, on the plane, so I took my nine year old son and I forgot <clears throat> that Garmin estimates are like James Joyce novels in LA. They're complete fiction. There's no connection to reality. So it would say, you know, from this point to this point, 15 minutes, forget about that. We didn't make it anywhere <coughs> in Los Angeles during our visit in less than 45 or 50 minutes. So it's a very, very difficult place to, to drive because of the, the level of congestion you have. You have like 12 million people squeezed into um, the area that is the Los Angeles metropolitan area. So it can be a very, very frustrating place in some ways as well. But anyway, I'm going to show you the clip from the, the piece that I produced about um, my interview with Frank Gerbar. Assuming that the technology is clever. So what do you think the best place in California it is to be? The best place to be? Yeah, like a, like a city or town. Uh, that's a tough question to answer because it depends on what you like, what you're looking for. It's My brother lives in Northern California and has for years. And he loves it and that's where his, he's chose to make a, by the way, Here's the other reason that California can be very difficult. My, my good friend Kyle, who I grew up with in Cape May, is a vice president at Warner Brothers out there. He lives out there with his family. He lives in a town called Redondo Beach. They just found a bargain home. You want to guess at how much it cost? $700,000. And that was cheap. That's cheap. Right? As much as we like to complain about the prices in EHT or whatever, seriously, $700,000 in EHT, you live in a pretty nice house. So that was the other thing, is the cost of living is so absurdly expensive. <clears throat> All right, so assuming that this will work, I will show you the piece about Frank Darabont. Frank Darabont is living the life that used to show up in his dreams. A successful screenwriter, he had never before directed a movie until the Shawshank Redemption. He made the most of the opportunity, and now he's one of the favorites for an Oscar nomination. In case I'm not Oh, the thing is. Oh, the bad man is saying. It's actually the story of a friendship forged in prison between characters played by Morgan Freeman and Tim Robbins. It's based upon a Stephen King novella. It's a really sort of great old-fashioned uh, storytelling. You know? And uh, so it's 
to, to emotionally epic in a lot of ways. And people need people are just simply responding to that. You know, I've seen it also respond to it in a lot of ways. Something about these characters and about this so many people uh, seem to be falling in love with. This is Darabont's first feature film, Mr. Director. As a screenwriter, he usually turns his work over to someone else. This time, he insisted on doing it himself. Maybe it wasn't that bold, but, but I'm it was an inevitable move, so maybe it wasn't that bold, you know, maybe it wasn't that bold as you think it might be, because as a screenwriter, you, you, uh, you spend many years of your career trying to put your heart and soul into something, and you see it uh, fail, and then you realize that you were wrong. Well, I'm sure you were wrong, but it's not like you were wrong in the sense of you were wrong in the sense of and Morgan Freeman is expected to be in the running for Best Actor. You mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. performance just sort of, it was going to win him on those indelible performances uh, where after you see the movie, you can imagine anybody else having played that role. While critics do the film high marks, Shawshank has had trouble finding an audience, but Darabont hopes a few Academy Award nominations will change that. If there are some nominations, it might, it mm -hmm. might uh, revive people who could still want to see it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I could imagine that that would, that would have a beneficial uh, effect on you know, the business of the film. So, we'll see. I ain't. No. Damn no. Yeah. Last well, Shawshank isn't doing Bako box office biz, Darabont is feeling its impact in some quarters. He's gotten fan mail. Pretty unusual for a director whose name isn't Spielberg. By the way, Steve wow. Mecca, who was the mail anchor, was a really good anchor and reporter. Really tremendous. Wow. Like the female. Wow. <clears throat> that wasn't exactly the line I wrote, but it was. Um, there's multiple people involved in the suit. And if you write the story, you write what's called a package, because that's what the term is used for a segment like that that stands by itself in a, um, in a newscast. The producer of the show, what's called the line producer, is actually the one a lot of times that writes the ad. So that would not have been my choice. But, but the peons on croutons is yours. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. I the, the, it was. The thing, one of the things about Darabont that I really liked, and you heard him, did you hear him actually say out loud, and I couldn't believe I actually got him to say this during the interview, but he actually said that, hey, when I've written screenplays, directors have screwed them up. Yeah. Like, that's something that you don't usually say out loud in Hollywood because you're always concerned, you don't want to make anybody angry, you want to keep all your options open, play it's close to the best. <laughs> Yeah, so I was, I mean, that's the other thing about it, that he was forthcoming. He wasn't trying to get out of there. So many times when I interviewed a celebrity, it was so clear that they didn't want to be there. And they were thinking about whatever was going on next, <coughs> not what was going on then. And he really actually sat down and tried to answer the questions and considered them thoughtfully and was invested in the results. And partly because it was all new to him. You know, this was his direct role in the but at that point, Shawshank hadn't done much business, and the Oscar nominations hadn't come out yet, and of course it got multiple nominations. But at that point, we don't know yet. We're just speculating about what those nominations might be. So that was something that was quite unusual in Hollywood. I'm going to tell you a few stories that about covering, and um, there were two shows that I worked on when I was at eight. One was called E! News Daily, which I think is pretty self-explanatory and is still on the air to this day. The other show was a show called The Inside Word, which I worked on first. The host was a guy named Michael Kastner. Not one of my favorite people. But that's Kastner right there. And that actually was the crew of the inside word. And then this is a picture of every celebrity that we had on the show, we get them to sign the board. And so after the show went off the air, because it lasted about a year, I think, we had the boards with the scribblings of every celebrity that had appeared on the show. 
but a couple of memories from that. And so in these kind of talk shows, these TV talk shows, when you do interviews, before the interview, you do a pre-interview with the celebrity when they arrive. And you do that in the green room. And the reason why it was called the green room is because it literally was green. It was kind of tucked away, a little bit away from the studio, and you bring them in in advance, and you would do the interview there. <clears throat> so one day, we had Richard Simmons on. He's nuts. <laughs> This is my, one of my favorite celebrity moments. I mean, it was like he was hopped up when he got there. And if you've ever seen his exercise bit, you kind of know that that's how he is. He went literally running through the studio, giving us all drive-by hugs. I wasn't even looking. And I wasn't part of the pre-interview. I was doing something else. And all of a sudden, I'm like, whoa! Just get, crunches me. And what I mainly remember about that is he wore this Alone that was like the most wicked smelling, <laughs> and I could not get that stuff off my clothes for like weeks. I descended through the wash several times before it finally came off. But but the thing that was so great about that was, again, he was being genuine. He wasn't posturing. He wasn't trying to be cooler than now. It was very um, very genuine. That's who he was. And so those were the people that you really remember that showed you a little bit of their human side. You know, not not so guarded and not so canned with their responses. Because you got a lot of those canned responses. Our first, and I know you're thinking it's glamorous and all. When I first started working at E, I started there in February of 1991. And um, the network went on the air in June of 1990. So it's been on the air for about eight months at that point. And we hadn't moved to our uptown gigs yet in the, in the Mid Wilshire Miracle Mile area. Our office was in a rundown apartment complex in Hollywood. And this was a bizarre kind of arrangement because the first floor and the second floor did not connect. You could not get from the first floor to the second floor inside. You actually had to go outside <coughs> and use the fire escape to get to the second floor. So if you wanted to get to somebody down on the first floor, I worked on the second floor, you had to climb down the fire escape, and you come in, then you go in the door, and every Friday on the roof, we'd have parties on Friday nights. It was kind of the end of the work week, and that's a picture from, from one of the parties. And <clears throat> because it was an old apartment complex, so you gotta imagine this, and you're probably wondering why I have a toilet up there. So, the office that I worked in was, there was a bathroom, and then the bathroom was a bathtub, obviously, a toilet. You kept files in the bathtub. So you'd be like, where is that file? You'd call them through the bathtub. And then we would literally, when you went to view tapes, you took out a wooden board, you stick it on top of the toilet, and we would review our footage on top of the toilet, and then log it and take it over to edit it. So it was a very, very quirky, quirky place. Eventually they moved uptown, but I gotta tell you that was, once we moved to the palatial things in Mid Wilshire inside the California Federal Building, it was a very different atmosphere. It was a little more corporate, it was a little more staid, it wasn't quite so creative, you didn't feel so much a part of the team. And so some of the best times were actually in this rundown kind of environment. And what surrounded us was nothing of note. That Hollywood neighborhood was just like other rundown apartment complexes, you know, some convenience stores, nothing to write home about to be sure. But it was um, that was really when the experience was at its best. Once we moved uptown, things were much more stale. So eventually we moved here to this building, the California Federal Building. And so, of course, it's E, and we're just getting going, and we have to be super hip. So our cubicles had purple cabinets, and then the color scheme was a kind of mint green. So it was mint green and purple. But that was 90s, wasn't it? Yeah, very 90s. 
But it was, we moved into like three floors of the California Federal Building. And it was a different animal once we got there. But it was still a fairly creative place. It was almost all young people. And everybody was just kind of eking out a living. It was really about all you could do. Because I know that's another thing that there's kind of misconception out there that if you weren't covering celebrities, you were loaded to do. I'll tell you, there were a lot of Honda Civics and cars like that in the parking lot. It wasn't filled with Mercedes and BMWs and whatever. So, but, but those were some of the best times when it was at its, when it was great and real and not so staid and corporate. I mean, now it's like, I went out and visited the new E facility because E is now owned by <coughs> Comcast. Which is owned, Comcast, of course, owns NBC, Universal Pictures. It's a totally different animal. Because I went and visited one of my old producers there this summer when I was out for the reunion, and it's completely different. I mean, for one thing, it's, you know, everything's been upgraded, but they have barely any staff positions. One of the, the, the really tough parts about the television industry is <clears throat> when I was working in the field back, back then, there's still a fair number of staff jobs which included medical benefits and so on. Mostly it's freelancers now. They'll bring people in project to project. So you'll come in and work on a particular show for a few months, and when that show is at the end of its season, you're out of work. You've got to find something else to do for those few months. So it's very much a business where you have to constantly hustle to stay afloat. And if you love it, that's okay, but you have to know that going in that it is it can be very, very tough on, um, on families sometimes. Like, I worked with a handful of people who did, you know, have children and all this talk because it wasn't a very, very sturdy kind of, kind of existence. <clears throat> I mean, I was in my 20s, so it didn't much matter to me. <clears throat> Dustin Toppin, I'm going to tell you a couple stories about film premieres. First of all, Dustin Toppin's really short, like midget like short. Sure. And um, so when you're at these premieres, you're lined up with other movie, movie, other entertainment, TV people, jostling for position, trying to stick your microphone in there. And a lot of the celebrities walk by and they won't talk to you. Like, typically, the stars of the film, they kind of have to because it's their premiere. But then there's other Hollywood types that come to the premiere and be there as well. So, one time, you got Dustin Hoffman, at least at the time, was an A-list kind of celebrity. And by the way, when you're out in Hollywood, that's how you talk about it. A-list, B-list, C-list, D-list. So if you're a minor celebrity, you know, you're D-list. If you're an OK, reasonably well-known, you're C. If you're pretty good, you know, you're being on the A-list, it's the top of the top. So Hoffman was a top of the top kind of celebrity, and we didn't know he was going to be at the premiere. So he kind of like, because he's midget sized, he managed to kind of snake his way down through the road line without really being detected. And then I can't remember why he got bottlenecked. He got bottlenecked at the end of the road line, and we all realized who he was. So we kind of rushed down there. And I knew that if I tried to fight the other media to get an interview with him, it wasn't going to happen. So I turned to the guys around me and I'm like, look, how about we all work together on this one, and we'll just pull the footage, because if we fight with one another, we're going to get nothing. He's going to go in. You know, leave high and dry. So that's what we did. But what I rem mainly remember about the interview is he was like mumbling the whole time. He couldn't understand anything he was saying anyway. Because we got back with the footage, and when we looked at it, we realized we couldn't use it. Because he didn't say anything that was really intelligible at that point, which I think he probably did on purpose which was probably smart, but he really didn't want to be, be interviewed by us. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> Dustin Hoffman? Oh, his movie career is... Rain Man. Rain Man. Yeah, it was Tootsie, um, Kramer versus Kramer. His, he has one of the most storied movie careers, and he's been um, nominated for multiple Oscars. He won for Tootsie. He won again. He won another Oscar, but I can't remember what it's worth. Running Man? Yeah. 
My favorite story, though, covering a premiere was uh, Michael Keaton, who starred Batman in various other movies. Actually, my favorite Michael Keaton role of all time is in Beetlejuice. Um, really energetic. He was nominated for that, but didn't, didn't win. But so, I had gotten into a car accident and I broke my left wrist. And, you know, when you're just kind of eking out a living, you go to work anyway. So I had my, my arm in a cast, and I'm kind of like typing all my stories with one hand, carrying my box of tapes with one hand, and so on. And I'm still doing my, doing my job, going out and covering the years. But it's much harder to get jostled if I normally have when you've got your arm in a cast. So I'm at a premiere for a movie called Speechless, which starred Keaton and Gina Davis as kind of competing screenwriters. It's sort of the, um, similar to, I can't think of the name of that, who actually worked for Bush and Clinton, uh, you know, the, uh, they're actually married. I don't know the names, but. Marley, Matlin, and, uh, yes. what's his name? Yes. <laughs> James Carver. Yeah. Okay, so anyway. It was a sort of similar story, so I'm, I'm really having a tough time this particular night. I'm getting jostled a lot at this, this premiere in Westwood, which is near the UCLA campus, and getting kind of frustrated, because it hurts when I get my arm knocked into. So Michael Keaton comes by, he's one of the main stars in the film, and wishes right by us, doesn't even stop, and gets accosted by another crew, I, I don't know who it was, another one of the evil entities, Entertainment Tonight or something. And um, he's doing an interview with them. And in the middle of the interview, he stops, walks away, walks over to me, and he says, hey buddy, what happened to your life? And it was a real human moment where he didn't, there was no reason to do that. There was nothing for him to get out of it by doing that. It was just, you know, it was humanity on display. And so, that was another one of those stories that really stuck with me because it was out of the realm. It wasn't the typical canned response that you got. And then he actually ended up doing an interview with us as a result. So my broken arm did <coughs> an interview with, with Michael Keith, I guess. But it was, um, those were the kind of human moments that you really appreciated when they did come about because they were so rare. Oh, interviewing celebrities. I'd rather interview a dog. I mean, because the dog might actually give you a, um, an unexpected response. They would literally memorize, if you've ever seen stories about an upcoming movie, right? And you watch what, well, my character is a, and they've memorized this whole response. And that they're going to, they've been given their talking points, almost like a politician, and they're going to, Spill the same talking points out because the marketing people have their particular things that they want to get upon. And that's all you're going to get out of it. And plus, a lot of times the publicists, when you're doing an interview about a TV or film project, they really restrict what you're allowed to ask. <coughs> so you're not going to get anything out of them. So those moments are the ones that you remember because they honestly were doing the marketing for you. The people I worked with, they were characters. And the people who work in television aren't characters. And those of you who are communication majors, most of you fit the bill on this, because you're all whacked. Right? <laughs> um, in fact, is not one of our, one of the primary criteria for being communication major would be mental illness. Because without that, we won't lay into the fault. But it was... I think that's a primary qualification. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, the people I worked with, it was a crazy bunch. And... Um, it was, I mean, one of the things, that, one other moment that was kind of fun for me is I was the, uh, I don't even know how this got started, but there was, there's a fairly large, you know, gay population in LA, larger than, um, than uh, the average town. And it was something that never, I was always very comfortable with it, but um, for whatever reason, I was always the one that got the gay stories. When I was working at E, whenever there was a story that involved gay cinema or something, it was always me that was doing it. For the reason. So after a while, people were like, you're the gay reporter. <laughs> <laughs> and what was really fascinating about this is so there were a group of 
producers, writers, sound there that were trying to start a, a network, a gay t cable television network. And so they were putting this together and they were looking for investors and all that. And I was the one heterosexual that was a part of the team because they're like, well, you're the gay reporter, so why don't you <laughs> help us out with this project? But um, one of the things, one of the things I did like about LA is you get over a lot of your stereotypes pretty quick because um, you are exposed to a lot of diversity, and that's definitely something that is that is a positive part about working in LA. But the entertainment industry itself is not diverse, and in fact, the Directors Guild, the DGA, just did a study recently, and. They looked at all of the prime time, all of the television series from 2011. So every cable series, every broadcast network series, and they looked at who was directing those programs. And the number of minorities and women were so unbelievably low, it was so out of, out of the norm. Even as bad as some other industries are, the television and the film industry was even worse. So, um, it's still a very male-dominated place, unfortunately. Very, very um, white, male-dominated. Well, hopefully you guys can go in there and kick some butt and, and shake things up. But um, it is amazing how, you, you know, a lot of times Hollywood is sort of painted with this brush of being a very liberal place and all that. It was amazing how it was still so backwards in terms of who was running the show. You know how many women have won Best Director in the history of Hollywood? One. That's it. Which is just unbelievably startling. And the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, 2% of the membership is African American. Which is, again, pretty incredible. That it's so skewed. So, um, not really as diverse as it might appear. One of the things that was great about the crack house <laughs> is that Herb Ricks, who's one of the best known <laughs> celebrity photographers of all time, was housed in a building across from the crack house. And he would get these celebrities to do photo shoots and he would take them up on the roof. And our roof was right across from his roof. So two of the moments that I remember best were one day, everybody went running towards the window. And there was a lot of sort of, you know, that, that scream that you hear when, when somebody famous is spotted. And Michael Jackson was up on the roof doing this shoot right here. So that was a moment where I'm not a big Michael Jackson fan, but he is, that is an A-list celebrity. But the bigger deal to me, one of the few times where I actually cared that I was seeing a celebrity was when Liz Taylor was on the roof. That to me, that's Hollywood royalty. She's somebody who is so iconic, so much larger than life, that that was something, that was one of the rare times where I was like, wow, it's Liz Taylor. Because like I gotta tell you, usually when I was interviewing somebody, I was thinking about the next question I was gonna ask, I wasn't. Who they were was not on my radar screen. It didn't even matter. What movie was she in? Liz Taylor? Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. She was, she's one of the greatest actresses in the history of human God. Um, and an iconic figure, married eight times, seven times, seven times. Mm -hmm. Her personal life was always kind of murky. And actually, Liz Taylor and, and um, Michael Jackson were very good friends. And she was very, very involved in his, his life. So, the boot. Dead now. Oh, she's dead. Yeah. Well, Michael Jackson and Tupac are gone in Argentina at Supreme Court or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with all the privilege. <laughs> right, Hitler and Marilyn Monroe, they're all down there. <laughs> I always love that people have all the conspiracy theories. Kurt Cobain's not really dead, man! It's all staged! It's an international conspiracy! It's the same people who did 9-11. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Yes. You can see the to-do list that day. 
kill Cobain, stage death, take down Twin Towers. <laughs> it's just so, um, but, but I was actually there when Cobain died, and that was, uh, you know, for my generation, that was kind of like a, like a Kennedy moment when he blew his brains out in Seattle, but it was, these are the kind of people, when again, when I think of the entertainment business, I think of people like Carol Patrick and, and Jeff Belker, who unfortunately died. Um, he was a piece of art. He was, they, they came with enthusiasm every day, they came with dreams and hopes, they were hardworking, because it was a lot of work to cover the entertainment industry, and we, um, we worked Christmas, we worked Thanksgiving, we worked all the holidays, because the news still has to roll, even on a holiday. So, but those, those to me, those are the folks that are the real heroes. It's not, being a celebrity is, I don't know, it's almost like a cliche to me at this point. But, so those were some of the hardworking folks. I'm also going to show you a couple of clips that are only semi-related to the entertainment business, but I'm going to tell you why in a minute. So, I was in Los Angeles from 1991 to 1995, right? Which is about the most tumultuous period you could have chosen. In fact, it may have been the most tumultuous four years in the history of Los Angeles. <clears throat> January 17th, 1994, Northridge earthquake. And that was, that particular year, you were getting a lot of snow back east, although many people have been doing that. But anyway, <clears throat> so I got to tell you, that was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Five o'clock in the morning on Martin Luther King Day in 1994, you get woken up by literally everything's moving around. I could see the walls going back and forth. And you're just, it's just abject terror. There's nothing you can do. You feel completely helpless. You don't know if you're going to die. And there's, in some ways, probably a good chance that you, uh, that you will be injured. So it was incredibly terrifying. So I remember having a conversation with my mom or somebody back east who was complaining about the snow. How terrible it was. So I stopped They're like, your weather's so nice. I'm like, okay, first of all, I never woke up screaming in the middle of the night because it was snowing. But I did wake up screaming in the middle of the night because the earth was shaking. <laughs> <laughs> so to compare and contrast those two, I think is a little ridiculous. But it was um it it had a tremendous effect on the entertainment industry as well because there were various benefits going on. There were many celebrities who got involved in the, in the cleanup effort, and, and so on. And the freeways were destroyed, which was just a disaster. Because my commute to work from where I live was, went from about 15 minutes to 45 minutes. Because all of the traffic that would normally be on the freeway had to spill out on the surface roads, and it was unbelievable. In fact, that morning, this is pre-internet days, right? So I don't know whether we're supposed to report to work. So I assume we are. So I drive in, and all the traffic lights are out. Everything's a four-way stop because they're all out. And when I get to work, our building, skyscrapers and earthquake zones are built on rollers. So they actually will have some give. So when I got there, like, literally the building is rolling back and forth. It's a 20-story building. And I went up to the office, checked in, they didn't need us to report and called home. And the whole time I'm doing it, the building's like, it was a really disconcerting feeling. You feel like you're going down. Like you yeah, it was well, still settling out from, because it was, it was a 6.6 .6 play. And then I also got to be there for the riots, the Rodney King verdict, which some of you probably don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. So I'll have to show you a clip on it. But um, <laughs> this was another thing that celebrities got involved with. The results, the benefits, it was unbelievable because there were literally, there had been riots in Los Angeles before, especially in the, in the 60s. Um, but they were pretty contained to certain neighborhoods, not this one. I, I remember we were at work at E, and somebody came on over the intercom and said, 
The riots are 12 blocks from here. You should all get in your cars and go home. And we were like, what the hell? So I remember for, for like three days, you were just kind of holed up in your house, not knowing what was going to happen next. And then eventually people started filtering out, coming outside, and so on. But it was also a major media event because, <clears throat> those of you who don't know the details, Rodney King was beaten by sheriffs, Los Angeles County sheriffs, along the side of the road. And it was videotaped. And so even though they had videotape, and he was beaten up pretty bad, even though they had videotape evidence, the first jury acquitted the cops. I mean, it was pretty cut and dry, and then the, the, the city just exploded, reacting to um, what had taken place. I was also there for OJ, the beginnings of that. I was there for the high-speed chase, the low-speed chase, whatever it was. I was in a bar watching the low-speed chase. It was like a month before I, I headed back east. So it was an incredibly tumultuous time. But anyway, to give you a sense, of that era, and particularly this one because it's such a media story. I want to, it's all right with you, show you a clip from the coverage of the Rodney King meetings. There was actually, it's about three minutes long. It was a retrospective that they did on the 20th <coughs> anniversary of, of the events. And it'll give you a sense of what took place and how the media was involved in it. Assuming that my link works. So it was, um, that was all part of the landscape 
of working out there. And LA is a place where um, there's seemingly natural and human-made disasters of, of every description on a fairly regular basis because you get the kind of lava near the world that we see mediated images and the palm trees and Venice Beach. Everyone's happy. But there's so much actual pain, poverty there, and, um, and confusion. And like I said, there's, there's a myriad of natural disasters because we started to joke after the earthquakes, what's next, locusts? Because we were sort of out of, we'd had an earthquake, riots, you know, the O.J. Simpson thing, mudslides, it was kind of unbelievable, all the, all the things that were happening in, in Los Angeles. But that was part of the backdrop, too, because there was something surreal about the perfectly coiffed celebrity in the sunglasses walking down the red carpet while the city burns, while the city shakes, while the hills come sliding down. And there are people's houses every spring. Every you know, December and January when we get the rain, people's houses would go sliding down the hill. And of course, they'd go right back, you know, and build them again. But it was also a place where virtually no one owned a home. Almost everybody lived, you know, in an apartment or rental property because you couldn't get together that kind of income that was needed to, uh, to buy a home. I knew people that I worked with that commuted two hours each way to be able to live in a place where they could afford a home. So they spent four hours a day commuting in. And after the quake, when the when freeways were destroyed, some of them spent six hours a day commuting in. Because there isn't a real extensive mass transit system out there. Because everybody wants to be in their car with their locks flowing in the breeze and the convertible. Cruising down the freeway at 33 miles per hour, which, by the way, is the average speed on the freeway. And you know 60. Your hair don't flap too much at 33. But um, it was, so that was part of part of the backdrop of, of covering the entertainment industry as well. <clears throat> Another insider bit that some of you may not know is that once Oscar season would roll around, it was really at the turn of the, of the year. So once you get into January, there were Oscar wars going on in Los Angeles. And in the rest of the world, you'd have no idea. But in LA, this was front and center to everything that was going on at that time. And Oscar awards, Oscar nominations do not appear organically, naturally, like they just get that Morgan Woods group of actors who are going to get an Oscar nomination. It's not like that. The studios push. They run ads like these in the various trade publications every day. During Oscar season, there were ads in the Daily Variety, in the Hollywood Reporter, in the Los Angeles Times, all pushing certain films or certain performances to get nominated for an Oscar. There were showings all over town for the members of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which is only about 5,800 people, by the way, um, that actually vote for the Oscar, and most of them are, are actors. Even when I, when I worked there, there were some films that, and this is the days of videotape, where they would literally mail a copy of the film that they were pushing to every single member of the Academy. So it was not this organic process that we sometimes think of it as. It was very much a war. And there were big stakes, because if you win an Oscar, if your film wins an Oscar, or multiple Oscars, your box office goes up. So there were real tangible economic reasons why this was important. Plus, nowhere are there a bigger collection of egos than in Hollywood. So there was that piece of it as well. And many of the decisions that were often made in Hollywood were made for ego reasons, not necessarily for what was best or most rational or would work well, but oftentimes to, to extend your, your ego. And <clears throat> there was a dress code. People always talk about how you know, in New York, they kind of dress like monkeys. The song, Randy Newman's song, I Love L.A. The first refrain of the song starts off by saying that he doesn't like New York because they dress like monkeys there. And right? so they all have that kind of zoot suit. But in fact, in L.A., there's a zoot suit too. It's just that you wear a suit, pants, and a jacket with a t-shirt. That's the uniform. It's still a uniform. 
because they like to talk so much about how much freedom there is to be who you are and dress how you want and so on. But in fact, in many ways, there's just as many restrictions as there is in New York or Chicago or other places. But <clears throat> the covering the entertainment industry was was largely a lot of hard work. And if you cover a premiere, that sounds very glamorous. But usually it was at the end of my, I had come in at 8 or 9 in the morning. And now it's 7, 8 at night. I'm still working. So I'm going on 12, 13 hours at this point. And <clears throat> when I was a producer, you didn't get a dime for it. Actually, when I was a production assistant, when I was a lower level employee, I actually made less money when I got promoted because I was now salaried instead of hourly. So when I was a production assistant, I would get paid for any extra time. Once I was a producer, I did it. So you'd go to these premieres, and it's 8, 9 o'clock at night, and you've been at this for 12, 13 hours. You're starting to get a little stir crazy at this point. And you're jostling for position at these things, trying to get the, the right sound bites that you can take back for the next day's newscast. And it's, it's physical work, too, especially if you're a camera person. Now, what I did as a producer and writer was a lot easier because it wasn't hard on my knees. Yeah, I'm jostling to get the microphone out to the celebrity. But like we had several camera people who had their hips replaced because of all the wear and tear, strain on lifting the heavy equipment all day long. And I have a buddy who owns a um, production facility in Philadelphia. And so you think that now everything will be peachy because the equipment has all gotten lighter. It's a digital world that we live in. Every one of us has a video camera on our phone. But he said the problem is now the equipment's so light that it won't hold still. So you end up having to put a lot of weights and tripods and other things on it to make it hold still. It ends up weighing just as much as it used to weigh, ultimately to get the shots that you need. So it's, it's a lot of it is really heavy work. And if you're a camera person or anyone who's dealing with the technical side of it, you're taking equipment down stairs, elevators, putting it in a van, driving it to the location, carrying it out to where you need to go. And even though as a member of the press, you can park, you have a different set of parking rules so you can park pretty close to where you're going, it's still a lot of lugging and lifting, and so that's another another piece of it um, that people may not realize about the way that the business works. <clears throat> but the bloom does come off the rose a little bit when you interview celebrities, because you realize they're not that interested. It's because for some of you who love celebrities, I would almost tell you. Communication, go into communication, you don't cover celebrities. It's the reason why I, don't, I didn't become a sports journalist, because I think I wouldn't like sports anymore if I did. It becomes, you get this insider view, and it, it almost takes away that magic that you love. You almost don't want to pull back the curtain, you know, like the way and actually see what's back there. Because you do, you have to look at it in a whole, whole different way than you did before. But it was, it was hard work, and it was a day-to-day -day grind at times. And it was, um, the one thing that's good, I guess, about entertainment news is you don't have to think very much. Because most of the things that we covered were planned for us. It's different from hard news where I don't know when there's going to be a fire or murder or whatever that I might have to go out and cover. In entertainment news, it was all prepackaged all events that you knew were coming at up, or except for what was breaking news in the entertainment news business? Anybody know? Tell me something that could be breaking news. Someone died. Celebrity death. Freaking George Burns. We had his obit done and sitting around for like 10 years. And he still didn't die. I shouldn't tell you this, but we did the celebrity obits in advance because if somebody like George Burns dies, we want to do his life justice, right? We can't do that in a matter of an hour or a few minutes or whatever, so we'd have it all ready to go. The guy would just kept going. He kept going. He kept going. And then, you may not know this, but celebrities always die in graves. True. 
when I worked out there, there were always, there was a celebrity death with like two more, two more kind of, we know this. And there were always, there was always a triad of, and so you could get that, you could get something like the O.J. Simpson verdict, could be breaking news. Sometimes if they announced a new signing, like for example when Jay-Z signed with Black Nation for $150 million, that could be breaking news. But for the most part, you know, it was pretty predictable. And when we go in on Thanksgiving, one good thing about being in entertainment news versus hard news was it's a little easier for the holidays. Because Thanksgiving, there wasn't anything that was going to happen that we didn't already know about, right? You get the parade footage from the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. There were always a couple of celebrities that would go around and serve food at the homeless shelter. That kind of thing. Um, we had a prepackaged story about football and women on Thanksgiving Day, how the uh, female audience was increasing for the NFL. And so, so that was the kind of stuff you'd have it prepared and ready to go. Get that balloon footage. Some puppies, you know, <clears throat> children and puppies, children and puppies, that's good holiday footage. And then from there. This was before the internet when it's all packed. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I almost, the, having the internet is actually, I think, done a disservice. Because the other thing that was true when I worked at E News Daily back in the 90s is really there was E News Daily and Entertainment Tonight, and that was it. That was the whole. Uh, enchilada. And so there wasn't the same level of saturation. Now it's ridiculous. You have Evening's Daily, Entertainment Night, you've got Access Hollywood. You have so many shows, networks that are devoted to celebrities, internet sites that are devoted to celebrities, magazines that are devoted to celebrities. Is Entertainment Weekly magazine under the same company? Is that the same company as it's ET? <laughs> no. It's not their own by I don't actually know who owns Entertainment Weekly, but I think it's one of the big, like, time, one of the big magazine publishers that owns it. But, um, but it was, it was not necessarily what you think it was in that regard, because the celebrities were pretty pre-programmed, almost robotic-like when you would interview them about a topic. And then there were times where you had to promote a project that you knew wasn't worth promoting. Because we that's what we did. We were serving it up for you. We were the entertainment industry's minion, right? We were their errand boy. So they come up with their project, their new film, and whatever, we were out there promoting. Getting, getting the audience to be interested, getting them to go out and consume that media product. We were definitely part of the, of the machine. But, I think the way that we all justified it in our minds was most of us still cared about doing something of quality. And we knew that what we did was important to people's lives, at least in the sense that they come home after a hard day at work and they want some way to escape, to de-stress you know, for a few hours. And if that was the only purpose that it served, then it was something that was, that was worth doing. But that was really the way we saw it. And I will tell you that most of the people, there were a few, Folks that I work with that were very starstruck. But most of us were pretty grounded. And I have to say, too, it's cynical. And stay starstruck even after dealing with you? Well, I had one friend who did. She was still jazzed up every time there was a new celebrity coming into the building hall. The buzz and everything. Because most of us were like, you know, whatever, I'm doing my work here. So what, Michael Jackson is here. There was, there was sometimes a buzz when you get somebody like that in, but for the most part, I mean, the person I was most excited to meet ever was Helena Bonham Carter. Anybody know who that is? Yeah. Tell us who it is since you're the only one here. So, you know, she's, in almost, she's in almost every uh, Tim Burton movie now. Um, she has another pretty significant connection to Tim Burton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I forget that when I watch a movie and I'm like, I'm just thinking of her as an actress. This um, is Helena Bonham Carter. Yeah, that's all I have to um, She weighs like 93 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> she's also uh, a really creepy Bellatrix and Strange in Harry Potter. Um, she was Ophelia in the Hamlet movie yep. once, one with Tom Gibson. Like Glove, like Glove. 
she was actually, she was one of the, the few people I was excited to meet where I was actually gushing a little bit when we had her on the inside work because she was, she was in all these period pieces and we were kidding her that she always had to wear a corset. So we're like, one of these days you're going to get a role, you know, in a romantic comedy where you don't have to wear a corset. But she was very, um, very down to earth and like jousting right back at us. Because that was another thing, celebrities would get angry, but they didn't usually have fun with you, she was just kind of giving it back to us. So that was a good moment, but. <clears throat> I want to, uh, before I put an end to this, I want to see if there's any other questions that you have, or comments, or anything else that you want to know about what it's like to, to cover the entertainment business. How do you get, like, hooked up with the uh, do you want the long version or the shorter? <laughs> the moral of this story, maybe this, this is the place to leave this, especially for all of you who can teach me. The moral of this story is that there's no such thing as a useless contact. And so, back in the dark ages, I mean, we don't even have cars yet, but <clears throat> this is 1991. Is it 91? No, it was 1990, actually. I just graduated with my master's degree from Temple University, and I looked like I was 15. I mean, I had like no facial hair. Um, so, I got this job teaching at Delaware County Community College in uh, Media PA, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Not a, not a little bit. So while I was there, I had a girlfriend who moved out to LA, and I was gonna follow her in a few months. So I was doing a little, doing a little work for the public relations office at Delaware County College, because I'm like 22 years old and I'm trying to make ends meet. So I'm talking to, I interviewed this administrator for a story, and afterwards I'm talking to her and I said, hey, you know, I'm moving out to LA in January, I'm going to try to get a job in TV. She says, really? She says, my cousin uh, works for Channel 9 in Los Angeles. Okay, his number. And again, this is pre-internet. Right? So she can't email it to me or text it to me. So about a week later, she says, hey, I got that number from my cousin. Um, so I move out to LA and I'm out there for a few weeks and I've totally forgotten that I have this contact. So one day I'm going through my stuff and I find the number, I call the guy up, and I said, yeah, you know, I know your cousin. He says, ah. Um, you know, let me put you on the phone with my producer. Okay. So I get on the phone with the producer, and the producer says, you know, we got nothing here, but I have a friend over at E! Entertainment Television named Ruby Sean McBride. Why don't you give her a call? So I call her, and she says, oh, um, get your resume right over here. We're having problems with one of our production assistants, so we might need somebody to get a lot. And nothing came of that. But a few weeks later, I get a call, and they say, we want to interview you for this position, Continuity Assistant. I'm like, sure, great, sounds good. Um, I'm still not even sure what that is, even though I did that job. But <laughs> basically it was doing data entry. Stuff that's still on the shoulder in one shot from the next shot, right? Well, this, my, my first job at E, and I worked my way up to the ranch, but my first job was like inputting segments into the computer. And these weren't like the computers we have now. But anyway, so the moral of the story is, there's no such thing as a useless contact, because I'm interviewing an administrator at a community college 3,000 miles away from where I'm trying to work, right? You feel there's no connection there, no possibility that this could be useful, but it's actually how I got my first job in TV. So, always be nice to everybody, and no one is ever a useless contact. You never know when somebody might need to know a contact that you can use to get a job. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And my students, did everybody sign the sheet?